I'll make stuff and I'll be like, that is so cool. People are going to totally dig that. And then it sits, they don't mm. dig it. And then the thing that I'm like, yeah, that's okay. That's cool. Boom. It goes like, it's the first thing to go. It's just crazy. You know, and, and I've talked to other knife makers and they're the same way, you know, that, that, that but you have to listen to the market, you know? So you, you, you try something, you test it in business. And if the test fails, then you move on to the next thing. And it's the same thing in knife making. You have to be willing to listen to what the market likes. You know, if, if the market wants carbon fiber, you do more carbon fiber. If the, if the market wants more fullers, well, guess what? Get on the mill and do more fullers. You're making fullers, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. Welcome. Welcome to another great episode lined up for you. Two interviews on this show, a knife maker and a knife show to talk about. But I do want to remind you first, before we dive into all that, that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Just simply go to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android, Kindle, or your MP3 player. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. And Bob, good info again this week coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast. That's right. We have uh, Douglas Esposito of Attention to Detail Mercantile. He's a new knife maker out of Manassas, Virginia, that has uh, been just, I don't know, his skill levels have just jumped off the charts since I've started paying attention to him. It's been about a year. And it was really great to talk to him and, and uh, kind of get a, a peek into a new knife maker's trajectory. Yeah. And some really gorgeous knives. I was looking at him on the website while I was listening to your interview and uh, just, just aesthetically beautiful, eye-catching designs, that type of thing. No doubt. And uh, I uh, outlined to him which combination of materials. Materials I think would be best <laughs> to have in one of his knives, and hopefully he got the hint. Hint, 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 wink, wink. Maybe a, <laughs> a knife junkie uh, exclusive coming out of that. But uh, he's living your dream, right? Martial arts studio with a knife making uh, shop in the back. Yeah. Why don't Why don't you put a sharper point on it, Jim? Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> he is indeed. <laughs> also coming up on this episode, we're going to uh, promote an upcoming knife show, uh, April twenty seven and twenty eight, a uh, knife event up in Groton, Connecticut, and we'll spill all the details out. Uh, about that coming up. But first, I do want to kind of plug the YouTube channel ever hmm. so close to a thousand subscribers and really would like to ask a favor for our listeners right now. If you're if you're not subscribed to the Knife Junkie uh, YouTube channel, please do so. Love to get across that thousand subscriber mark here pretty soon. That's right. I put up uh, knife review videos and just uh, sometimes just what's in my pocket kind of quick uh, videos. But also uh, YouTube is a fantastic place to uh, listen to podcasts if if that's what you have uh, close at hand. So don't forget that you can listen to this Knife Junkie podcast right there on YouTube as well. Absolutely. And if you'll uh, subscribe and be sure to click that little uh, bell icon, you'll be notified anytime Bob posts a, a video or whenever the, uh, the podcast goes live on YouTube. And I know I uh, watch, air quote, YouTube a lot. Uh, without even having the screen on, just using it as an audible player, if you will. So uh, go to the knifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. That stands for YouTube, obviously. The knifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. And be sure to subscribe to the knifejunkie.com YouTube. And Bob, once we hit that thousand subscriber mark, a little something special maybe coming up? Uh, yeah. I have, uh, well, an idea for one or two knives that we will be giving away. Ooh. I'm just honing in on which one uh, it should be. But only to subscribers. Uh, yes, exactly. Only only to people who subscribe, who have been subscribed, or who are new subscribers. But right. the point is to uh, come become part of the family here and uh, see what the payoff is. The knifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. Stay tuned. We'll learn about the uh, NCCA's annual extravaganza knife show coming up. But first, next, it's that interview with Douglas Exposito. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. On this episode of the Knife Junkie podcast, I'm speaking with Douglas Esposito of Attention to Detail Mercantile, a custom and handmade knife outfit new to the industry but making a fast impression. 
Douglas is a former Marine, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, an entrepreneur, and has been a knife maker for less than a year. But you won't believe me when you get a load of the A2D Mercantile Instagram page. His grinds are immaculate, and his recent compound grinds are the equivalent to bragging in the medium of steel. There's a lot more to talk about, but I'll let him tell you all about it. Douglas, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I don't feel like I can live up to your uh, your intro. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> oh, I was just trying to write something cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that. Oh, please. Former Marine, thank you for your service. It's always humbling to speak to someone who, who served, and uh, so I thank you for that. So, Douglas, you make knives by day and teach Brazilian jiu-jitsu at night in your own school. Have you always had an entrepreneurial spirit? Or are you living the dream here? Well, if working 17 hours a day and, uh, you know, kind of people, you know, you making your own hours, but your hours are longer than everybody else's is the dream. Then yeah, sure. Let's go with that. Well, they say, uh, entrepreneurs work 80 hours a week, so they don't have to work 40 hours a week. Yeah. But it's worth it. Oh yeah. And as a uh, martial artist myself and someone who has dabbled in uh, knife making and is most certainly just an enthusiast, the idea of spending your day in that way it seems like the hours almost wouldn't matter, though I, I'm sure it's physically exhausting. I'm I'm used to long hours. So, you know, people say that when you love what you do, you don't work a day and blah, blah, blah. But mm. you still work. But, you know, if, if, you, if you don't do it, nobody else is going to. So you, you got to get this stuff done. So uh, what was your experience in the Marine Corps? Where did you serve? Uh, I was an infantry, infantry guy. And uh, did some deployments with uh, two one one four and then uh, two four. Uh, so West Coast guy. And then my last couple of years were out in uh, Quantico, which is why I ended up out in Virginia. Okay. Okay. So you did some uh, some instructor training, some close combat instructor training. Yep. What what kind of stuff is that? Is that that's all hand to hand combat? Well, you've had some some Marine Corps martial art instructor trainers on your show, but it's uh it's first and foremost it's a weapons based system, and then uh, and then you know obviously the the body's the weapon, the mind's a weapon. So there's bayonet, knife, stick, you know, hand to hand, ground fighting, striking, improvised weapons, all that kind of stuff. So kind of r- runs the whole gamut of of uh, combat. And, uh, you know, other than other than calling for fire and, and, and shooting, it's uh, everything inside of that. So here you are years later. You're a, a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu several times over, I'm assuming from pictures I've seen. Uh, how long have you been doing Brazilian martial arts, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu? And uh, tell me a little bit about your school. Sure. So I've been doing martial arts since I was about 10. Um, I'm 50 now, so that's about that's 40 years. Uh, I've done, you know, karate and Thai boxing and jiu-jitsu and wrestling and all that kind of stuff. The Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, after the UFC, if you were going to be a complete martial artist, you really couldn't avoid doing jiu-jitsu. So, you know, I informally did Brazilian jiu-jitsu for a lot of years. And then um, when I was finally able to link up with people that, uh, you know, were ranked and actually were, had a, a, a lineage, then I was able to pursue that. But, you know, we've been doing we've been doing ground fighting and stand up fighting forever. But uh, having the system of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and things like that was a really nice addition. And um, I'm lucky to have had the, the coaches and the, the experience that I have with that. So you have a school yourself? I do. I've got a, a school in Manassas, and then I've got a couple of affiliate schools in the area, and then one out in Yuma, which are my black belts run. That's amazing. So you, you're teaching, you're making knives. Were you, were you always into knives, and, and how'd you get into making them? Well, so I, uh, I've been a, around the knife community for a long time because I've been in the, the tactical and gun community for a long time. I had a job when I got out of the Marine Corps as a contractor, and part of my job was to go to the shows and see what kind of new gear was out there and, and bring oh, them. That sounds awesome. It sounds that, but when you have to go to six or seven a year and, and then you're running ranges and bringing stuff, it wasn't bad. It, it, it was a good job, but there's only so much... There's only so much they're going to do with the information that you bring back. And so there, there came a time where it was like, you know what, I need to, to go and do this other stuff. And it was a good, good, good time to break. But like I said, I've been around, been around the industry and I've known people in the industry for 20 years, 25 years. And I know guys that have been doing this for 30, 25, 20 years and making a good living at it. And uh, we've just been friends. And with some of my businesses, I have to 
it's obviously cheaper if I do the build out for whether it's a gym or something else. So I was doing a lot of like woodworking and welding and uh, running electricity and wiring things and things like that. But uh, I hadn't done any, I hadn't worked with steel. And I was like, well, I got friends that are, you know, knife makers. So why don't I just, I'll give this a try. And I'm enjoying all the other stuff that I've been doing. And, and, uh, but then I started to get really into it. And then having the, the people that I could reach out to. And, you know, most of it's just me figuring the stuff out in my shop. But when I run into a wall and I'm just, you know, wasting more material than I'm doing anything good with, I can, I, I've got people that I can reach out to and they're, they're gracious enough to, to share with me because we're friends. And, you know, sometimes it's like, Oh, everybody knows that. And I just don't. But, and then other times it's like, Hey man, it took me 25 years to figure this <laughs> out. So please don't tell anybody, but yeah. you know, here's, here's this or that. And it, it, it's, it, it's, it's really nice to have that. And when, when I first started and it's just been over a year now, well, it's been, it's been about a year and a half since I, you know, ground my first, you yeah. know, I wouldn't even call it a knife, you know, it was this, this horrible piece of metal in my garage. And, you know, I, I, I look back at that stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, this is horrible. But I, I showed it to some of my buddies and they were, they're my friends. So they're, they're not going to be nice. So mm -hmm. they, they, they were, they were very, they were like, look, this sucks and this sucks, but there's something going on here, you know? So it was nice to, you know, they're not going to blow sunshine up my butt and any of that kind of stuff. So it was nice to get some good feedback. Of course, now that I look back on that stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, why did they, why did they, they were so kind, you know? Like <laughs> <laughs> They saw potential. Yeah, they saw the potential for sure. Well, you're lucky because, well, it's not luck, but you don't have to look back that far to see that first piece. But I watch you on Instagram all the time. I'm I'm checking out your pictures and, and uh, it seems like you got very good very quickly. And so that to me means you must have some latent talent in there that you didn't know about until you actually turned on the grinder. Well, the talent part, maybe, but a lot of guys, when they first start getting into something, it's, it's very part-time. It's a couple hours here, a couple hours there. Um, I'm, I, I'm a little bit um, obsessive compulsive, maybe, or whatever, whatever you want to call it, addictive personality or whatever it is. So a lot of times people are like, man, you're getting good fast. And it's like, yeah, but the hours, like there's weeks I do 80 hours in the shop. You know, if there's a show coming up or something's going on, there's 80 hours in the shop just like that. Right. And people just see the week. Yeah. Yeah. They, they you know, they talk about for mastery, 10,000 hours. Well, I would, mm. I would argue that it's longer for a lot of things and I mess a lot of stuff up and I, you know, it's like, I make a lot of mistakes, you know, Bob Loveless. I, well, I, I don't know. He didn't say it to me, but I've heard the quote where, you know, if you want to get good at making knives, you're going to have to make it a bucket of really crappy knives first. Right. Or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Right. You know, and I've made like two or three buckets of crappy knives. I got boxes where I'll just be like, oh, this is total crap. And I throw it in the box, you know, and then then I go back and I look at it. I'm like, yeah, this was oh, my gosh, this was horrible. So it, it's a, it, there's a lot of reps. I've had people be like, oh, man, you just want to work on one knife, start at the beginning and take it all the way through the end. Well, I don't make mistakes fast enough if I do it that way. So mm. I'm doing at least four knives at a time in the same style so that I get I get reps. I'm big on reps, repetitions and 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 practice, whether it's jujitsu or shooting or whatever you're doing. Mm. If you're going to get good at something, you got to have a lot of reps. So that's that. You know, you got to fail fast, make make a lot of mistakes, and and so uh, I've been able to do that, and that's I think that's that's helped a lot. And I still have, I mean, you know, I, I look and I feel like Salieri, where I'm just like just starting to see, you know, like being able to know enough about it to appreciate true greatness. You know, like you're, you you right. realize you're nowhere near that, but you can appreciate that. It's kind of like the more work you do and the more you see how difficult it is to achieve true mastery, the more you appreciate a master, sure. you know, masters make things look easy. Before we go any further, actually, describe your knives to people who might not be familiar at, at the moment. So my concept is, so, you know, I did the time in the military and so people are being on like tactical and tactical and all this other stuff, but uh, I, I don't, I don't deploy anymore. I don't dig cat holes. I don't dig mouse holes. I don't. You know, I don't even open an MRE anymore if I can avoid it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I have that I have that hard use ethic 
right? Where it's like, I don't want to have to worry about the finish or, you know, if I, if I need to use a knife or something, I, you know, and that includes as a screwdriver or as a pry bar or whatever I need to do. I want to be able to use it that way. People are clutching their pearls right now. You know? <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't make it to not be used. I want it to be used. And, uh, but the, at the same time, I, you know, I'm, I like a little style. I like a you know a little bit of uh, flair is not the right word, but you know like so the the, the concept is a hard use gentleman's knife. People always talk about hard use and people talk about gentlemen's knives, but I kind of wanted to bring those together. And, and that's where, where I've been going. And as, as a, as truly, you know, almost an apprentice or a total beginner at this, I'm focusing on, you know, some of the class, the classics are classics for a reason, you know, so the, mm-hmm. the basic Lee for spear point fighter, the Tonto and the Bowie. But within those, there's so many variations. There's so many different things that you can do. And when you add compound grinds and different angles and, you know, watchmakers call them complications, right? The more, Mm -hmm. the more aspects you have in a watch, it's a complication. So with a knife, you can add all of those things and make it kind of cool. You describe it as a gentleman's hard use knives. That's to me, uh, the perfect description. Right now, they're all fixed blades, mm-hmm. and and they range, uh, at least from my observation, small, medium, large, basically. Yep, yep. Uh, medium to me looks like the most EDCable. I, I don't like a fixed blade that's too small, and and the large one just looks nice to put on your hip. You've used a lot of different handle materials that are very appealing to me, and you've started to DLC your blades uh, on the flats. I've noticed a lot, so I've come up with the perfect combination. Uh, I think I told you this. That well, let me would write be, it down, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the double-edged bayonet grinded fighter, ground fighter, uh, with um, DLC on the flats. And you've been using a little bit of the tortoise shell. And to me, nothing says gentleman's knife like a tortoise shell. So in, in all seriousness, I think those things are... the. That combination of uh, materials and uh, grinds and styles really do lend to that, to what you're describing. And I know you've been using 3V steel, which is a very robust fixed blade steel, which must be a hell of a time to, uh, to grind, by the way. But if knives are tools, and and I'm not saying that you're approaching it strictly from a tool aspect, you are definitely an artist or or approach it with an artistic touch. How much consideration should aesthetics take when when designing these things? Yeah. So, you know, I have maybe what we call mentors and friends that go way past what I do. And then mentors and friends that are like, well, that's not really my style, but, you know, don't get too flashy there, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think there's, I think there's a lot of room for it in today's day and age, and especially in the space that I'm looking for. And I think as long as the aesthetics don't get in the way of the usability, there's mm-hmm. things that I see people do, and I'm like, man, I would just never do that because it affects any any number of things. And I, 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 I want to stay positive, and it's not, it's not a sure. negative against anybody what they're doing, but it just it's not something that I want to want to do because it would affect usability and and stability and structure and things like that. And I, I, you could probably argue some of the stuff that I do might possibly, you know, in a super, super hard use situation. But one of the things I, I really enjoy is when somebody contacts me and they say, hey, I want to do, I want a, a knife. And so my first thing is, well, what are you going to use it for? Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're using it for boar hunting, we're going to do different things than if you're using it for, hey, it's just an EDC and I want to be able to open boxes with it and all that it's kind like of stuff. Slice sausage when I'm out on a <laughs> picnic with, yeah. yeah. And there's nothing that, like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And to know that and to know well, that what else do we actually huge. use? Well, yeah. I mean, no, some people, they, they use them for, you know, hey, I'm going to kill the boar in the, in the boar hunt. My dog's going to hold sure. it down and I'm going to, I'm going to, sure, you know, sure. I'm going to end its life with it. So it's a tool and what are you using it for? You know, and sometimes people will be like, well, I really like this. I'll be like, what are you using it for? And I'll be like, yeah, that's not really the model you want. Why don't we do this? The edge geometry is going to be better. The grip, the handle, like you actually want a bigger knife or a smaller knife or whatever. So. So far, um, who's your customer? What do you, what are they using their knives for? If you hear back from them, um, fishing, hunting, um, everyday stuff. I, I, I have a Skinner that, like, I I haven't even had a Skinner on the the website because when I make them, my buddies and people that I know that are hunters, they snap them up and I get orders for them. So I'll make four or five, but 
they're all sold. So I don't get a chance to put them up on the, the website or even really get them to dealers. I haven't had a had one to dealers. I need to make more of them, but you know, hand making every single one, you know, hand profiling, hand drilling, hand, everything, you know, slows down the process. At some point I should probably just get a sheet of Skinner's water jetted and and go from there. But um, I just haven't gotten to that point yet. So, you know, that, that's, that's, that's cool for me. Like I, I really dig it that people are, you know, I, I get pictures back of people, you know, taking down, taking down a buck that they got with it or, or, or hunting hogs, you know, you get, you get a picture back and it's like, man, that's, that's awesome that they're, they're getting out there and they're getting used. It's got to be very, very gratifying, not only to be able to create the thing, but to see it in use further than what I would most likely use it for, which is to carry it around, have it and hold it and love it and and collect it. I think your stuff is very collectible in that uh, you have a, you know, you don't have like a tops knives, endless range of knives you make yet, uh, but within your four or five model, you know, well, sure, you, you sure. outlined the general types, you have uh variations within that that someone who gets into the your designs could could just keep finding a new excuse well this one i need without the deal (laughs) you know yeah well so so far i haven't made any two knives well i take that back i take that back and i'll tell you this is a funny funny quick story i haven't made any two knives for my you know that i've just made exactly the same i had a a a buddy that bought two knives he wanted two skinners for his daughters because they hunt they were matching and then I had one of my coaches, he said, hey, uh, I really like a, a Skinner for me and my brother. I said, okay, cool. Do you want me to do different grips or, you know, different handles or whatever? He's like, no. He goes, make them just the same. And I was I was just about to say, I said, is that so yet? And he goes, yeah, that's so I can steal his when I lose mine. <laughs> I said, that's brotherhood right there. You yeah. know, like, no, make them exactly the same so I can steal his. When I lose mine. And blame him for losing his own. Yeah, yeah. So that's those are the only two that I've made exactly the same. And you know, I'm I'm exploring and 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 having fun and like you said, working with different materials. So at this point, I'm just uh, you know, even if they're similar, they're 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 different. It might be a similar grind, but then different handles or or whatever. So, you know, like I said, I do between two to six of the same knife, but they're all gonna be a little bit different grind. Maybe I put a fuller in this one, maybe I do a false edge on that one, maybe I do a compound grind on that one, but just kind of seeing how they work with the different thicknesses of steel and the different blade profiles and all that. So your recent compound grinds, uh what inspired those um and and what utility do they have? Uh, that's maybe different from a straight grind. Sure. So, w- w- well, let's talk about the utility. The the utility of it is that y- you have the hollow grind on the belly, so you're able to have a really nice slicing edge there, and and take away a lot of the mass, and st- and just really have a nice edge that's sharpenable and resharpenable, and 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 can you know because people use the belly of the blade mostly to to slice and you know chop and things like that. But sometimes when you're working with thinner stock, that really thins out the point and gives you a very thin point. So the the compound grind, you the ones that I've done, they have the flat grind on the front, which gives you more material up front in the in the point. So, you know, God bless you if you're stabbing oil cans or whatever you're doing with right. your stuff. Uh, it, you've got more, more support up there. So that's the concept of it. In the future, I want to do more testing and, you know, uh, post videos. And, you know, I mean, everybody loves the the testing videos. And I'd like oh, yeah. to do, do a little bit more of that. In fact, when I mess something up, like post heat treat, I'm like, oh, there's a test knife. And I put it over there and I got a, I got a little a little stash of when I start testing stuff where I'm going to like, OK, I, I'm not worried about messing this one up. So I'll be able to really get into it with this piece. Um, and then as far as my inspiration, I, I've, I've known um, guys like Mick Strider and Steve Ryan for a really long time. And obviously, you know, Mick and, and Steve have been doing the, the compound grinds for years and years and years and years. You can't look at their stuff and not see that. And uh, and, and I, I send them when I do one, I, you know, the first few I did that they were the first guys that I texted. I sent a picture. I'm like, hey, thanks for the inspiration. Here's the thing. And they were like, hey, man, that's that's looking cool. And, you know, hey, try this next time. And, 
you know, like I said, one of the best things about this community is, you know, 90% of the people are just really, really cool about this. When they see you getting into it and and and, and digging into it, they're going to be very forthcoming with, with info and because you mm. still got to do the work, you know, yeah. just like anything else. You, the information in, in today's day and age with YouTube and all this other stuff, the information isn't the barrier to entry. It's putting right. in the hours. It's putting in the time. So, um you know, and, and like I said, I've, no, I've known those guys and a lot of other guys in the industry for a long, long time. There's other guys that have done compound grinds, but, you know, th- those two guys I've spent time with and, and, and I've admired their work for a long time and I've seen them do their stuff. And, you know, we, we, we talk. And, and so when I'm able to, to, to do that and share that with them and they're like, dude, that looks great. Keep up the work and stuff like that. that that's huge. You know, that means a lot to me. It's yeah. really rewarding. And you know, they've been there, whatever situation you, you find yourself in right now while you're doing a compound grind, you know, those guys have been there before and probably have some good advice for you. Maybe it's just that little tweak that changes your whole trajectory. Well, and I've told, I've told both of them and other knife makers that I know, you know, when you're, when you're in the, in the shop, there's only so many different ways that steel can meet the, the belt. And there's only so many things you can do. And so when you think you, I'll be doing something like, oh, this is cool. And and I, I haven't seen, maybe I've seen it before, but I didn't know the effects on the steel or whatever, but I'll do something. I'll be like, oh, that's really cool. Now I know a thousand people have done it before. I'm not the first person to figure this out, but nobody was like, hey, do this. So it's like, oh, that's really cool. So you have that like that that discovery for yourself mm-hmm. and it's like that's cool but i it's not like i have an ego where i'm like oh i totally because <laughs> it's been done a hundred thousand times before but you know every time i think i'm like man that's really cool and man it's better and, and then i'll be looking through instagram and i'll see something you know somebody will post something like hey here's this knife from you know 17 years ago <laughs> and it's like yeah i i yeah you you're awesome <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's it's humbling it's 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 humbling as well it's nice so when you're when you're grinding a regular blade uh symmetry i would imagine is already a challenge you know from one side to the other especially when you bring in you know a swedge or a whole top uh bevel but how is that multiplied when you start uh messing around with a with a uh compound grind in other words is the is it harder to achieve that symmetry Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, again, it's like every time you add a complication, it's, you know, you've got, you've got, I've heard people call it facets, but just from watchmaking, I like that. I like the complication. I don't know if people have applied that to a watch before, but I mean, to a knife before, but I'm stealing it from the watchmaking and I'm applying it to the, the knife making. But anytime you do that, there's a whole nother, you know, there's a whole nother geometry that you have to make match on two sides or four sides. And you have to make match at both ends so that it's symmetrical from the front and the side and the bottom and that the blade matches up. So sure. It's, it's a, uh, it's always a, it's a challenge. It's technical. That's challenge. why they call it the nightmare grind, right? I don't know. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mentioned in the beginning you're an entrepreneur. That's obvious from your your gyms and your your knife making career. That's that's taken off. Is this a good business for an entrepreneur? Is this a good industry for? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a horrible business, but it's a it, it's a very rewarding uh, hobby. Um, it's just like it's like any other business that I've gotten into and, and I've failed. You just you talk to any entrepreneur that's been at it for a while and they've failed at more things than they've succeeded at. And, uh, you know, if you don't really have a passion for it, it's very difficult to get through the time and, the, and put the energy into it that you're going to need to to get to where you need to be. So most of the things that you're passionate about, there's a thousand other people, a 10,000 other people, a hundred other thousand other people that are passionate about it. And when you're passionate about it, it's also hard to be business, have a business mind about it. You know, I I read a book a long time ago on martial arts schools when, you know, that, that people open up a martial arts school with a black belt mind. Like they're like, well, I'm a black belt and this is what I would like. Well, 99.9999999% of the people that walk into the gym they're not black belts. They're looking mm-hmm. for a totally different experience. They're looking for a totally different thing. So you have to look at what, from a business standpoint, what the customer is looking for, right? The market will drive what it wants. And so, you know, that's that's something that I've learned over and over again. When you think that you're going to you're gonna school the market and you're going to 
you know, educate the market and bring them up and all that. Now your cost of customer acquisition goes up. There's there's a million other things that happen. So you really have to pay attention to what the market wants, you know, um, and and I'm certainly no no stranger to that. You know, I, when I see what I'll make stuff and I'll be like, that is so cool. People are going to totally dig that. And then it sits. They don't mm. dig it. And then the thing that I'm like, yeah, that's OK. That's cool. Boom. It goes like it's the first thing to go. It's just crazy, you know. And, and I've talked to other knife makers, and they're the same way, you know. That, 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 but you have to listen to the market, you know. So you, you you try something, you test it in business, and if the test fails, then you move on to the next thing. And it's the same thing in knife making. You have to be willing to listen to what the market likes. You know, if, if the market wants carbon fiber, you do more carbon fiber. If the if the market wants more fullers, well, guess what? Get on the mill and do more fullers. You're making fullers, buddy. Yeah, exactly. It, it seems like uh, that there could be a lot of challenges to being a one man shop, but it seems like that particular point could be an advantage to being a one man shop. You you can react more uh, nimbly and quickly to you know market demands and the changing tastes of the fickle public. You don't have to retool an entire factory and get a whole bunch of people on board with a new product line. Sure. Yeah. So what what are some of the challenges there? Don't get me started on the business edge of it. We'll need to do a whole nother, like if you want to talk about the business edge of it, it goes into a totally another, totally another thing. Different place. Yeah. Well, tell me about the monkey muster. What what exactly is that? And tell me about your experience there. Sure. So um Brady over at Monkey Edge, he's he was my he was my first dealer. I've known Brady for a long time because he's other friends of mine's dealer. And uh he was in the Navy, I was in the Marine Corps. So when we met, you know, we kind of had that military background in, in in common. And uh we were talking before the show and that his first monkey muster was seven years ago. And I went um, because I just happened to be in Southern California at the time for work. And uh, a couple of my buddies were going to it. And so I was like, yeah, sure. It's the weekend. You know, it was like, you know, I was working in San Diego for the week and then I was going to be working the next week there. But I was like, oh yeah, let's go for the weekend. I'll drive out with you. So we drove out and we, we had a good time. It's a knife show that's not like other knife shows. What's really cool for the knife maker is that they, you know, Tommy is, Tommy Latham's out there and he's awesome with it. And the whole staff is amazing. They take all your stuff and they, they put it out for sale. There's, there's a, uh, I'm not even doing this justice. So at the top end of this, it's a Fisher house, a Fisher house foundation. Mm, uh, yeah. They do an auction where you basically your, your ticket into it as a maker is to donate a piece to the Fisher house auction. And so they auction it off on Instagram and people bid and, and all of the a hundred percent of the proceeds go to the Fisher house. If you're not familiar with Fisher house, they provide a place for service members, families to come and spend time when the service members hospitalized. So, you know, if you're in Walter Reed for a year recovering from being blown up or shot or whatever it is, you know, your family still lives in Oklahoma, but in order for them to come out, they either need to sell the house or, you know, do something so that they can come out and spend time with you. And so what Fisher House does is it gives people a place to stay. It's kind of like the Ronald McDonald house and all that kind of stuff. So right. certainly uh, something I could get behind and, and support. So that's the top level. And then they also do, just like any other knife show, there's lotteries for those makers who you know are so in demand that people enter the lottery to buy their piece. And so those are there. And then also all of the guys that that Monkey Must or that uh, Monkey Edge is a dealer for, they have their display cases and all the stuff is there. So people are able to come in and you know, looking at display cases, do all this stuff and, and they have a great time and the, the food and the drink are free and, and it's a good time. So it's it's a, it's not as big as a blade show or, mm. or these other other things, but everybody there is way into knives, way into the, the you know, collecting and the higher end pieces. And, um, and they're also into having some free booze and food. So it's a good time. <laughs> Well, from all the uh, Instagram posts, it looked like Lollapalooza for knives. It just looked like a like a blast. That's about right. Um, so, what are you aiming at with attention to detail, mercantile? Where Where do you want to see the company? How do you want to see the company grow? Um, that's a real good question. Um, I would like to keep it fairly small. I'm not looking to get too over my head with this stuff. I, I like having a hands-on approach with every piece. I like all of all of my other businesses that have been successful, not the ones that I failed at, but the ones that I've been successful at, there's a personal aspect. There's a personal connection. So that's part of the reason that I love doing customs 
you know, people like, hey, I want to do a knife. OK, well, what are you using it for? OK, well, you know, and, and, and making something specific for the task. But you also form a connection with that person. And that's that's really cool. And, and going to these shows, that's another reason that I go to all the shows that I go to, because you meet people and you're like, oh, man, yeah, we're on. You know, we follow each other on Instagram. That's cool. Well, here's you know, it's, it's really nice to put a face with the with the IG handle or whatever it is right. and, 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 and have that personal connection with, with what you're making. And, and I, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to get to the point where I lose that. And, you know, we're, we're trying to get folders done for blade show. I'm not going to promise anything. I've been prototyping and, you know, I will get the profiles of the titanium and the steel water jetted because there's just no way to cut every right. single one out by hand, especially titanium in a little shop. Like, I mean, my shop's 13 by 27 or something like that. Right. I'd have to charge, you know, $4,000 a, a knife just for the belts that I would <laughs> use to grind all the titanium, you know, but, yeah. but just having them profiled and drilled out so that everything's flat and parallel, there's still so much fun stuff and so many details and so many cool things that I'll be able to do to those. And I'm really looking forward to that, you know, obviously hand grinding and mm -hmm. I do all the heat treat, everything that we do, we do in house. And so just to go back, not to, not to be a, a stickler or spend too much time on detail. Uh, I, it's, I do all black oxide right now. I'm not doing any okay. DLC. I don't, I okay. don't want to, um, the DLC is, um, it's expensive and you have to do a big batch to make it worth it. So I'm not against it. I think it's an amazing coating. I just, at the black oxide I can do myself. And so that's right. everything we do in house right now. So even the karambits, I drill out that hole and, you know, chamfer it and, you know, grind out all that steel. And so it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's very, it's very rewarding. I'm learning so much and having such a great time. And like I said, being able to connect with people and share, share that stuff. And it's a tool that is going to last past when they're, you know, if they take care of it, they can hand out to their kids, their, 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 their grandkids and so on and so forth. You know, you go into a museum, what do you see? It's the swords, the spears, yes. the sheep, you know, and, and, and that stuff was iron and bronze and all this other stuff, the mm -hmm. you know, CPM grade stuff that we're using now, it's going to last 10,000 years or more, you know? So it's, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to share that with people and, and have that connection. Well, how can people find your knives? How can people uh, get in touch with you and buy, and buy your stuff? Sure. They, they can, uh, I, I, I'm not a big, so in business, you communicate with people how they want to communicate. So if you send me a smoke signal, I'll figure out a way to send a smoke signal back. But, uh, you know, we, we, we do DMs on IG. We do messages on Facebook. The emails are easy to keep track of, you know, attention numeric to detail mercantile at Gmail, or they can go to the website and, you know, if you put attention to detail knives or any of that kind of stuff in there, it'll come up and then they can contact us on there. You know, I've got, I've only got a couple dealers and I, I'm, I plan on keeping it small. And again, people that are interested in the, interested in the story and having that personal connection, those are the people that I'm working with. So they, they I've got stuff on uh, E knives. Clay has my stuff over there. And then Brady has my stuff. And look, man, there's a ton of other great dealers. I'm not trying to slight any dealers. These are just the guys that I know and, and have known for a long time. And when they were like, oh, you're making knives? Cool. Let me know when you're ready to sell stuff. You know, they, they, they were right there. And then there's a there's a really cool gun store locally to me. It's called Vienna Arsenal. Mm -hmm. And Mike has that stuff up there. You probably know about them. We're fairly, we're fairly yeah. close to being neighbors. And they've got some really cool stuff up there. And so Mike's carrying some of my pieces up there as well, which is super cool. That is great. Keep it personal. And, uh, and the knives, like you said, they'll just keep going down the generations. So you're leaving your mark on history, sir. Hopefully it'll be a positive one. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. Everyone who's listening, check out Attention to Detail Mercantile, uh, I, especially on Instagram, because a lot of beautiful pictures going up there all the time. And check out Douglas Esposito's Fine Knives. Uh, Douglas, thank you again for coming on the show, and I hope to talk to you soon. Bob, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it.
you know you're a knife junkie if you love your knives more than your kids. We're back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim, the knife newbie person, along with Bob, the knife junkie, DeMarco, and Bob, another fairly new knife maker that you had the chance to uh, interview, just like last week's show when you talked to Jim Skelton. Douglas Exposito has not been making knives that long, but, man, he's already making a, a presence and churning out some great-looking knives. Yeah, uh, speaking with him and then uh, also, as you mentioned, Jim Skelton a week before and just sort of paying attention to their uh, how their work has evolved. I, I got to say, these, t- these two guys both worked very, very hard, put a lot of time in and also found mentors to teach them, you know, the ins and outs of uh, various aspects of knife making. And I think that combination, that sort of mentorship and just lots of uh, sweat going into that is is how you get to be... Uh, making great looking knives so quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and both of them seemingly, uh, as the old story says, came out of nowhere, kind of overnight success, but truly had only been making knives for, what, year, two years, that kind of thing. So not like somebody that's been doing it for 20 or 30 years. Yeah, I guess so. Work hard and find people that can help you. And uh, get back in that shed. So have you gotten back in the shed to start (laughs) making your knives yet? Uh, I have not. That's coming uh, (laughs) next weekend. After vacation. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) All right. Well, speaking of knife makers, knife collectors, and uh, knife junkies, we have the pleasure now of talking with Larry Clifford. He's the uh, show coordinator and a board member of the Northeast Cutlery Collectors Association. It's the NCCA's 37th Annual Extravaganza Knife Show, and that's coming up Saturday and Sunday, April 27 and 28. And Larry, thanks for being on the Knife Junkie podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. NCCA, Northeast Cutlery Collectors Association. Let's first talk a little bit about the club and give you a chance to talk about what you uh, guys and gals do in the NCCA. Well, as you mentioned, uh, this is our 37th annual show. So we've been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been in the club for about 13 or 14 years and a member of the board of directors for about 10 years and uh, happened to be the show coordinator for our annual two-day show, the Mystic Marriott. It's a pretty strong knife club, uh, you know, situated in the Northeast primarily, but we have members all over the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we even have a couple international members, but uh, I think we're about 500 strong and uh, growing every year. The, The shows are quite well attended, particularly the Mystic show, because of the you know, the, the caliber of show that it has become mm-hmm. in the Northeast here. Mm-hmm. It's just a great show. Right. What what makes it uh, that, that high caliber? Is it the exhibitors that you have? Is it the displays? What? Tell me a little bit about that. Mainly the exhibitors because we get such a variety of, uh, you know, we have uh, quite a few top name makers, lots of up and coming knife makers, plus uh, a large quantity of knife collectors and dealers of antique knives of all types from all over. So you never know what's going to show up there. And it's, it's always quite impressive. Mm. Uh, we do get some pretty good displays too. Uh, last year, the highlight was a massive trade display. And we do even have a direct descendant of the family, Bill Schrade, direct descendant of George Schrade, who uh, put together with uh, a few of his friends, a massive uh, Schrade display. It was just incredible. Well, and you mentioned some of the uh, exhibitors. I think you're you're also an exhibitor. Did I see that right? I am an exhibitor. Yes, I am. I've been collecting for about 30 years and uh, became a dealer, so to speak, about 15 years ago. And well, it, it kind of takes over itself, you know? Right, right. What is it about knives that uh, got you interested in it? Just always um, had, a, had a passion for them as a kid growing up, always had a knife in my pocket mm-hmm. and... Uh, Actually, my wife got me started collecting about 30 years ago, bought my first uh, collectible type knife, and it uh, took off from there. Blame it on her, right? I, I do quite often. <laughs> That's right. Give our listeners, uh, Larry, the uh, kind of the logistics of the NCCA's uh, 37th annual show. Uh, again, we kind of mentioned the date, but dates, times, uh, cost, again, kind of locations, any special things like that, as well as uh, any tables for exhibitors left and what they should do to maybe get in the show if possible. Uh, well, I'm actually sold out of tables. Oh, great! We do we do sell out this show every year. Um, I can start. I have a, a started a waiting list. There's always a chance somebody cancels. Um, it's only a couple weeks to go, so no guarantees there. But um, so yeah, it's on the 27th and 28th of this month. Uh, we have set up for the dealers on Friday evening from 6 to 10 p.m. Lifetime club members can get in during setup to look around and. Uh, we do get a bunch of those guys coming in for the for the early deals. We open at 7 a.m. for vendors 
on Saturday, and then we open at 9 a.m. for the public, and it runs till 5 p.m. Saturday. Saturday evening, we have a knife auction, and the public is invited to that. Uh, you can bring stuff in to sell. It's a lot of fun, and you never know, never know what's going to show up to the auction. It usually lasts a couple hours. Then open again at 9 a.m. Sunday morning and run till 3 p.m. At 2 p.m. on Sunday, we have a our custom knife raffle with knives that have been donated either by knife makers or uh, dealers. And uh, this year we have approximately 13 or 14 knives donated. And you never know what's going to be in that group, but it's it's always very, very nice custom knives. So for a for a five dollar raffle ticket, you could win a quite a substantial knife. Mm-hmm. And the cost to attend the show? Oh, it's uh, seven bucks. OK. And that's seven per day. Yes. Yeah, seven per day. Kids under 12 free. OK. All right. And uh, where can folks get uh, more information, directions, that kind of stuff? Is it on your website? All the information is on our website. They can also contact me directly. My, my contact info is there also. And that's at www.ncca.info. All right. NCCA.info. We're talking with Larry Clifford. He's the show coordinator of the NCCA's 37th annual extravaganza knife show. Again, that's Saturday and Sunday, April 27 and 28. And that's at the Mystic Marriott in Groton, Connecticut. And Larry, thanks for being on the uh, Knife Junkie podcast. I'll give you the final word. Anything you want to say about the show or anything we haven't, uh, haven't uh, talked about yet to uh, try to encourage folks to attend? Just wanted to uh, point out we do have a total of 71 vendors this year. We have 103 tables, and I cannot fit any more tables in the room. Otherwise, we would grow the show even more. But uh, it's a great, great show. We have makers from all over, uh, all over the U.S., and uh, the popularity of the show is growing because of the, again, because of the caliber of of people that attend. So uh, I encourage everyone to come on out. Sounds like a plan. Larry, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. And Bob, unfortunately, I think you're going to be on vacation, buddy. We can't make a quick road trip to Connecticut. No, I know. Next year, most (laughs) definitely. (laughs) There's always something coming up. That is going to do it, Bob, for the Knife Junkie podcast this week. I'll give the the final word on the podcast to Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Uh, I would say, well, uh, just as we heard with this knife show and also with uh, Douglas Esposito, attention to detail, mercantile, there are a lot of a lot of places to look to find unique opportunities to buy knives, collect knives, get your hands on a custom knife. And, uh, you know, you find a rising star, you could be on the upward ascent of the value of of collecting uh, a new maker's knives. So I say just do your investigation, go to shows uh, and, uh, you know, do your investigations online. Find some good custom knives. And find something that you like that, that appeals to you. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.